This lecture is about health policy analysis and using the Eightfold Path for your analysis. Health policy is part science and part experience, but it should also be part compassion and reason. The Eightfold Path provides a structure that helps one to focus on the story that must be told. A New York senator or a New York representative once told me that all the statistics I give him will not help him explain his vote to his constituents. What he wanted was a good story that he could tell. The Eightfold Path helps you as the policy analyst to assess the evidence, determine the desired outcomes, describe the possible ways forward, and then remind you that you must tell your story. Here's my one ground rule for using the Eightfold Path. If the story you tell likes, lacks compassion or fails to recognize the essentials of human dignity, then you need to re-examine your work. Compassion and human dignity should never be among the trade-offs. The path doesn't have to be followed in the exact order. For some people, there are going to be options that are off the table immediately. For example, if you're one of the great believers that you do the greatest good for the greatest number of people, then you may conclude that the best option to save the most lives during a disaster is to focus on healthy adults. In other words, to focus on those people that don't require extra resources or personnel. That means that you then conclude that because those in the hospital slow down the evacuation and take more, more resources and take more time, that you may leave those behind. But does it mean that we don't plan for the needs of children? Well, if you're taking this approach, then yes, so you would leave it off the table. Obviously, neither of these options respects human dignity and both lack compassion. Yet for years, there was much more disaster planning for healthy adults than there was for the sick. And until recently, there was virtually no planning for children. So let us get started. The Eightfold Path is broken down into defining the problem, assembling the evidence, constructing the alternatives, selecting the criteria, projecting the outcomes, confronting the trade-offs, deciding on which you want to choose, and then telling a good story. If you follow the path and apply compassion and reason, at the end, you will have a well-developed policy analysis. One of the beauties of this approach is that it helps you to get the job done. Too often, People get so far in the weeds or spend so much time trying to build the perfect policy, they forget the old adage to not let the perfect be the enemy of the good. It also reminds us that what we are doing must be feasible. An assistant secretary once told me, I asked you for a Chevy and you gave me a Cadillac. There was no way he was going to be able to sell that Cadillac, or in any way justify the cost. So what I had done was giving him, given him an option that was not feasible. So whatever you do is tentative, and you will need to go back and revise as you go through the process. The more information you gain, Probably the more revision you're going to have to do. But you start by defining the problem. There must be a reason for undertaking a policy analysis. And that reason should have direction. This is the reason for doing policy work. 
what private troubles warrant definition as public problems and thereby legitimately raise claims for amelioration by public resources. In brief, there are two types of problems um, that require action and the use of public resources, and one of those is market failure. But the second one's non-market failure, and obviously that's huge. And these are things such as family breakdown, low living standards, where markets don't reward lack of skills and discrimination as just a few examples. For example, you might list as your problem, there are too few physicians to provide primary care to all Americans. The demand for primary care or the demand for primary care exceeds the availability of primary care providers. It may have been fun to say that the problem is nurse practitioners are not allowed to practice to the full extent of their skills because physicians worry about competition. The problem would then be that we would be using rhetoric to define the problem that we can handle in a more analytic manner. In policy analysis, we need to be aware of the political and institutional means to mitigate the issue and tone down inflammatory rhetoric. Our goal is to find a middle way that re will result in the best policy, and that means avoiding partisan rhetoric that encourages extremes. Let's take an example with lots of issue rhetoric. The Affordable Care Act. Here's some, of, here's some of the rhetoric you will hear. There are too many uninsured. There are too many abortions. There are too many unwanted pregnancies. Contraception is too expensive for some. Are any of these the problem? Or is the problem, maybe, why are there too many teenage pregnancies? What you quickly find out is that you may be using one piece of legislation or a policy, the Affordable Care Act, to address something else you want to address, which is unintended pregnancies or abortions or the general public paying for contraception. But by throwing in all of the issued rhetoric, what you do is you make it hard to actually address the policy and solve the problems. Rather than rhetoric, try quantifying. How much is too much? What is the magnitude of the problem? So how much should women pay for contraception? Should it be free? How much should insurance cover? Should they cover 100%? How many abortions are too many? How many could be prevented by contraception? So you must gather the information about the magnitude of the problem. And you have to not let yourself be pulled in to the rhetoric of what's actually happening. You need to first gather your evidence and look at how big the problem is. The next step then is to assemble your evidence. A good policy analyst spends a lot of time thinking. She also spends a lot of time looking for the evidence. This can be reading existing laws, policies, studies, visiting the library, interviewing people, and begging for appointments with people that possess the information and then getting them to share it. And getting people to share information about policy isn't always easy. And we'll talk about that later, um, maybe in another lecture, about how important it is to make sure that when you go to an interview, you're prepared because you may only get one shot with that expert.
You may need an esp estimate or to set a range and make sure you aren't using this to define the solution. Don't define the solution into your problem. You should not say there are too few contraceptives available to teenagers. This assumes making contraceptives available would stop teenage pregnancy. So what you want to do is collect only the data that can be turned into information and then converted into evidence. Do not waste time on information that can't be turned into evidence or go down a rat hole reading articles that are not related. You need to stay focused. And you always know if you start searching for something that there is this big tendency to go Google something. And what you will find is it will take you way off track looking at things that are unrelated. They may be interesting, but you have to stay focused. With your data and your evidence, um, here's what you need to remember. Data are facts. Evidence is information that affects the beliefs of people about significant features of the problem. Although there are some people <laughs> that would argue that no amount of evidence is going to change minds, that people believe what they believe and you can show them evidence and it won't matter. But for most people, actually, if you give them the evidence, it may take them a while to think and to reflect, but they do understand and can be persuaded. So you need evidence. And there are three purposes for the evidence. You want it to assess the nature and the extent of the problem, to assess the particular features of the concrete policy you are studying, and to assess policies that have been thought to work and have been effective in similar situations. So think before you collect. And once you have collected your data, you can construct your alternatives. This is when you come up with your policy options. Not all options are mutually exclusive. Start with more options, but when it's time to present, keep it to two or three. Do not ignore the current political sentiment. Bardak suggests that you make one of your alternatives the status quo. I strongly disagree with this approach, especially if you think it's unacceptable. The problem with much government policy is that too many people accept the status quo and say it's acceptable to do nothing, when in fact it's not. Policy analysis really is not for the faint of heart. Bardak suggests consulting and getting input from outside sources. The extent to which you can do this is really going to depend on who you work for and how much influence that person has. Uh, if the person has a lot of influence, then you're probably going to get a lot of access. If the person has little, then you're probably going to get little access. Also, how much access you get depends on the popularity of the topic and how much people want to help. And don't forget there are trade-offs. Remember that input from your enemies is as important as input from those people that share your views. You generally can't bully your way through, po through policy. If you try, you will end up acting like our Congress and President and accomplish very little and even if you get the policy through, good luck getting it implemented. The next step is to select the criteria. The most important feature you are seeking in your criteria is does it predict the outcome? So the important part of selecting your criteria is will the criteria predict the outcome? 
The criteria established are meant to judge the outcomes and not necessarily the alternatives themselves. What are some of the common criteria? Efficiency. So is it cost effective? Then you want to look at equality, equity, fairness, and justice. Does social justice matter? It should. Look at freedom, community, and other ideas. Freedom from unreasonable intrusions and manipulation and equity in the community. And a lot of us have heard a lot about this re recently. How important to our sa is our safety to us? Is it so important that we think the CIA can spy on us and read our emails and track our phone calls? Intrusion or manipulation is important. And then process values, democracy and the belief that people should have a say about what affects them. Policies may not necessarily need to be forced on people. People should have some level of self-determination. There are also criteria that you really cannot ignore are legality, political acceptability, and the real world. So there is no point wasting your time on an option that violates the Constitution or the law. There's no point in wasting your time if it isn't politically acceptable, because if it isn't, it isn't going to happen. And then real world issues. Uh, just because something sounds good on paper doesn't mean that it can actually be implemented. Because when you actually get out there in practice, when you get out there in the world, you will find that there are things that looked good in the sterile environment of an office and on a sheet of paper. But when you put in all the variables that actually occur in a clinic setting uh, or in a factory where you're trying to put safety policies in place, what you thought looked good on paper actually doesn't work. If your favorite policy alternatives then you want to project the outcomes. You selected the options, so project the outcomes for each. You need to be realistic. Uh, you ideally should use social science, use multiple models, and look for the best models. There is not just one way to look at a problem. There are multiple ways to look at a problem. And for anybody that's ever taken a theory course and said, why do I need this theory course? Well, theory teaches you how to conceptualize problems. And for if you look at a problem from different perspectives, you're more likely to see things that could become areas that are going to cause you to fail that you may not have predicted. So don't forget that you still need evidence. Then you have to confront the trade-offs. Sometimes a decision must be made between the cost of a service for some people versus the total cost per year. How can a congressperson vote for that? How can they vote for something that has an outrageous cost? Um, and then sometimes it's such an important issue they're going to say, how can they not vote for something, no matter what the cost? So there are four steps in confronting the trade-offs. First, you ask yourself, what is minimally acceptable effectiveness given the cost? And you really do need to remember that money is not unlimited. Not if you're a local government, or a hospital, or a clinic, or the federal government. There are limited resources, and you have to look at them. What new processes or change could achieve the desired effect? How likely is it to be implemented? And that it will, be achieve, that it will achieve the desired outcome. And then don't forget to consider the possibility of failure, and then think about what are the results if you do fail. 
So then you have to make a decision. You have to decide. The first thing you need to be able to do is convince yourself. If you can't convince yourself, you're really not going to convince anybody else. And one of one of the ways you can think about this is the $20 bill test. And the story goes that there are two people walking down the street and there's a $20 bill laying on the ground. And one person says, oh, it's a $20 bill. And the other person says, well, how could it possibly be a $20 bill? Because if it were, surely somebody would have picked it up by now. You need to know that you may have a good policy idea and you may hear from people, well, if it's a, such a good idea, why hasn't somebody already tried it? Just because the answer seems good and obvious, the fact that no one has done it doesn't mean that it really is a bad idea. It may actually be a good idea that no one's tried. Good ideas, good options require effort and follow through. Just like bench research, it's wonderful in the lab, uh, but if no one figures out how to get it out to the bedside, what happens? So you have to follow through. You can't just propose your good idea and then let it die. And then your final step is to tell your story. Telling your story is about knowing the audience and appealing to that audience. Remember I said that New York representative told me, you need to tell me a good story. Your statistics aren't going to help me convince my constituents. Well, when you are defending your policy, yes, you need that evidence. You need it in your pocket. You need to know it inside out if somebody asks. But first and foremost, when you present your idea, you must be able to tell a good story. You need to be able to give examples. And then you need to approach your presentation with confidence and with passion. You need to have presence. One of my... Um, one of my bosses one time told me that presentation is half the battle. If you come with a nice presentation and you make it look nice and you say it with passion, there are a lot of people that because of that will be less critical of everything in it. But if you come and you're not prepared and you lack passion and you lack a nice presentation, then most likely people are going to wonder about the quality of everything you said. All right. I hope this helps to explain some approaches to policy analysis and how it actually happens. A lot of people think that when Congress passes laws that all of this stuff is just thrown in there, people make it up, and there actually isn't any analysis that goes into it. Or when the Department of Health and Human Services uh, implements policy based on the legislation that was passed, um, that there's just a group of people that take all their political beliefs and they put them on paper and that's the policy. And that's really not how it works. Um, there's a lot of effort a lot of thought that goes into policy.